Herzlich willkommen. Ähm, alle, äh, die hier sich versammelt haben, ich bin ganz überwältigt auch von diesem neuen Saal, weil ich bin jetzt hier zum ersten Mal, seit es renoviert wurde und auch zum ersten Mal in der Mitte der Reihe die neue Moderatorin. Mein Name ist Eva Maurer, mein Kollege Jan Dütwer hat ja die ersten drei Vorträge gemacht und <lacht> hat auf jeden Fall das Recht, auch später zu kommen. <lacht> und jetzt übernehme ich. Ich freue mich, sehr hier zu sein. Ich begrüße Sie alle ganz herzlich. Wer, wie ich, die letzten Vorträge live verpasst hat, kann Sie ja nachhören eben via Webseite oder auf dem YouTube-Kanal der UB Bern. Auch heute eben wird dieser Vortrag als Podcast aufgezeichnet werden. Das Housekeeping ist auch wie immer, wir werden erst den Vortrag haben. Ich werde ganz kurz die Moderatorin, äh, unsere Referentin heute äh, einführen. Ähm, danach haben wir Zeit für Fragen und ich ermutige Sie alle, die Diskussion wirklich auch sich angeregt daran zu beteiligen. Okay, jetzt wechseln wir wieder einmal das Land eben nach ähm, dem ehemaligen Jugoslawien und vor allem ähm, Ostmitteleuropa der Tschechischen Republik und kommen heute nach Ungarn. Wir kommen auch immer weiter in unserer Reihe in die Gegenwart, wo auch heute natürlich Familienpolitik ein zentraler Bestandteil aller modernen Sozialpolitiken ist. Ähm, heute werden wir uns eben ähm, mit vor allem Ungarn befassen, allerdings durchaus auch in einer ähm, vergleichenden Perspektive. Und wir haben eine Referentin, die sich eben schon seit vielen Jahren sehr vertieft auch mit den Themen Sozialpolitik, Sozialstaat in Ost- und Ostmitteleuropa befasst. I would like to do the introduction in English, so you can correct, yeah. correct me if I, <laughs> if I have any blunders. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Dorotia Sikra, who is a senior researcher at the Center of Social Sciences in Budapest and a visiting professor at the Department of Gender Studies at the Central European University in, uh, in Vienna, formerly Budapest. Her research is sort of located at the intersection of, of political regimes, of social politics, gender studies, and welfare and family policies, and especially also, I would, if I can say that, under the conditions of limited democracy, not only the last years, let's say, uh, Fidesz rule, and other illiberal regimes that we have now, but also uh, under the socialist regimes of the past. And I think you have seen it already in the last uh, lectures here, if you have been here, that the social, how different, sometimes contradictory and varied um, socialist family and social polities have been. So now we are really curious to see how the case of Hungary has played out. Much of your research has a very comparative perspective. Um, I think you will be showing the cover of your latest edited volume where it's uh, about family policy in Poland, Hungary and Romania in comparison, uh, edited together with Kristina Rath and Tomasz Inglot. And another of your publications focuses on the connection of welfare policy and democratic backsliding in Turkey and Hungary in comparison, which I find very interesting. I will also let circulate two more texts, one on Hungarian women's organization NGOs and another more general introduction in German on welfare policy in general. Also, what I find interesting that um, apart from research projects and academic positions, um, Professor Sikra had also served for two years as a member of the EC commissioned high level group on the future of social protection and the welfare state in the EU. So sort of policy advising on what social policies, what the welfare state of the future could actually look like, which is a topic, of course, which is very highly discussed in all European countries. So I'm really happy to welcome you here. Um, please welcome her for her talk, The Family Above All, Family Policies in Hungary from the late socialist era to the Orban regime. Thank you, uh, Eva. Um, um, I'm so happy to be here and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, I have some roots in Switzerland <laughs> um, as my father used to work uh, in, um, as, a, as an engineer uh, in Berner Oberland in Frutigen. <laughs> so <laughs> I lived there for a while. 
Äh, ich bin äh, eben äh, ins Seminarschule gegangen in Thun äh, und picked up some Schweizerdeutsch. <lacht> so, but uh, it's kind of gone now, so, <lacht> as I didn't practice and I haven't been back since then, since my teenage years. So, I'm really, really happy to be, to be back here. Uh, so, um, the talk uh, I, would I, I will give today is about Orban's familialist uh, welfare regime, but not just that, but also where it comes from and why I think that it really is a successful branding of Hungary, because I think it really is. It shows the human face of this increasingly authoritarian regime, whereas at the same time, uh, it is not, this is why the question mark there is, it is not for all Hungarian families, but it is, this regime is for some Hungarian families, some select target group of the Orban regime, so they celebrate it as if it was for all Hungarian families, as if it was a model, for other countries, even beyond Europe. But at the same time, it really is for select, better off, white, hetero heteronormative, heterosexual families. Uh, so the outline of my lecture is this. <clears throat> I would like to show first some pictures and some explanation of how the family is in the center of Orban's politics. Second, I would like to give a comparative perspective so that you see that this is not the case everywhere in Eastern Europe. So this really is a special thing that we see now in Hungary, but it comes up in other countries too. And third, I would like to show you why it happens in Hungary, and I believe it has very strong, very important historical roots that actually go back before the Second World War, and even before that, to the turn of the century. So it's not a coincidence that Orban is so successful with his family politics in terms of popularity among the population, but it does have its historical institutionalist roots. And fourth, I turn to the exact policies that Orban made. And finally, I show you some of the impacts of these policies, and then I'm really open to any questions uh, you have about them. And you will, I think you will see that these policies are special in many ways. They resemble the old days of the 1930s and 40s, very interestingly, rebranded to a post-modern society. Uh, but they, they are policies you will not find in Europe uh, anywhere else, I believe, but you may question that. I'd be very happy to hear actually your, <clears throat> your remarks also on the Swiss family policies and, and how what I tell you compare to, to, to what happens in Switzerland current, currently. As far as I know, it's also a conservative regime, uh, but maybe in other ways than, than in Hungary. So, um, first, um, Orban was on, uh, in power uh, already uh, in the early 2000s, between 1998 and 2002, and even back then, they made family policy in the center of their agenda, but not as much as today. What they do today, what is different in his rule after 2010, 2010, he has been on, in power since then, so for 13 years now, and usually he wins with two-thirds majority and with increasing chances for the future because the whole system became more and more authoritarian, so it's very difficult to actually uh, win for the, uh, uh, for the opposition, for the other parties that still exist in Hungary. So uh, he has put family and family policies in the center of his politics, and this is an example of that. 
Um, it's a, um, it, uh, it is a placard, uh, a billboard, uh, about uh, a new type of loan for newly wed couples. And I will turn back to that later on. I will explain what it really is about. What I'm saying is that he put family policy into the center of his agenda, especially since 2015, internally, so to gain popularity within the country, but also externally. This is another picture about how he framed uh, the discourse, political discourses through family policies. Um, maybe I... I uh, yeah, I make it like this. So um, these are other billboards. So there have been lots and lots of billboards in Hungary and YouTube advertisements and advertisements everywhere in every channel you can imagine, television, about uh, his family policies. And this is a great example to that. This is the positive, ex uh, positive message he sends, and that is... Um, the child is the first for us, and uh, in July, we start with the Family Protection Action Plan. Try to remember that, Family Protection Action Plan. And here is the ideal family, you see. Uh, there are two kids, and there is a third in the belly of the mom, mom right? And there is a car here too, because this action plan, as I will explain later, allows three plus families, so families with three or more children, to buy a van. This is one example of, of, of this action plan, right? But there are many other points of that, that 2019 family protection plan, right? And this is the opposite to that, so there is the family policies, that's the positive message, and here is the negative message just right next to it, and it says, we, our message to Brussels is that we have to stop migration, okay? A bevándorlás meg kell állítani, that means we have to stop migration, because in Orban's rhetoric, migration is fostered by the European Union, it wants, the, the EU wants um, people from the uh, global south to invade Europe, including Hungary, right? We don't want that. We don't want dark-faced southern people coming to our country um, and, uh, yeah, to our country, but we want to become great from within, right? The nation has to thrive from within and not with the help of these uh, immigrants who would kind of solve the demographic danger, demographic problem of other European countries, for instance, Germany. This is the discourse, right? So there is the bad, the evil, that is the EU, and that is the migrants. There were really, really harsh anti-migration and anti-migrant campaigns throughout uh, the past years. Very aggressive ones, so I would say. And the positive message, the antidote to that is the family, the Hungarian family that should be celebrated and promoted. How does that work in external politics, in foreign politics? politics recently, in the past, I would say, five to seven years, Orban realized that he can make family policy a, a brand to uh, sell Hungary uh, as a, as a po with a positive message. And also, he, could, he managed, actually, to unite the far right of Europe and beyond, also including American far right, to invite them to Hungary and to present themselves together with Orban and with our current um, president, uh, Katalin Novak, in white there. I will talk about her later a bit more. And you see Maloney in the center. This, this is just a very recent picture. And Orban to the right. Um, 
and they come together for the demographic summit in Budapest. So they always have every year, I think every year, not every second year, a demographic summit in Budapest and that's a major event for right-wing politicians uh, who are invited and not only politicians but also uh, think tanks and media stars. Uh, Elon Musk was invited this year. He didn't come finally. Uh, and this is Katalin Novak, who uh, is a key figure in this endeavor. Uh, she has been a vice secretary of state in the giant Ministry of Human Affairs that was set up in 2011. So Orban stopped to have Ministry for Education, Ministry for Health, Ministry for Social Affairs, whatever, but united them into one giant ministry. Actually, it was quite a smart move in the sense that now there are no ministers who would be lobbying for the education to give more money for the education, more money for the, um, for the healthcare and so on, or not to talk about social policies. So there is, so, so this way he kind of uh, sidelines some of the important veto players, some of the important players in the field of uh, social policies and um, other, other uh, policies about the welfare state. So created this giant ministry and within that ministry there was one unit on um, social inclusion and family or something like that. And there, Novak was a vice secretary of state. But she seemed to be a very talented politician coming actually also from, um, from foreign affairs. And she built up a big secretariat with quite a few young, talented scholars like yourself, uh, serving her to, in, to invent new types of family policies, right? I was interviewing her and her colleagues, and I was really lucky to, to get in at one point. Um, so, and then she, um, pro she proceeded to become the Secretary of State, and at one point she became Vice Head of Fides, right? So she kind of elevated to top politics, and Orban realized that she was very successful, and that family policy was very successful in the sense that it made uh, Fidesz more popular, emo, even among uh, the opposition. And then uh, she uh, was elevated to be the vice president of Fidesz, and then later on, just uh, last year, she became the president of Hungary, right? So she is now the positive face of the Hungarian increasingly um, I, I almost said totalitarian, but it's actually an authoritarian regime. It tot tot becomes totalitarian in many ways in a sense that it really wants to know about everything and I would say it kind of, is it, the regime is now under the skin of people, I would say. So you hear it, you can't escape it. In that sense, it's now a totalitarian regime and, and Novak is the, the human face of that regime. Now, uh, to turn to the comparative perspective, and I uh, promise that we will get, get to, to our point um, at, in the end. Uh, so this is the book that we uh, have written, we didn't edit, we, we have written, written that book together. It, it took us 10 years with Tomasz Inglot uh, from Minnesota State University. Um, and uh, Christina Rath, who is uh, from Cluj and uh, is a head of department of sociology there. Um, and it's about the politics of family policies in these three countries, in Poland, Hungary and Romania. And I'm really, really proud of this book, not only because it took 10 years for us to, to do that research and, and write the book, uh, we went to all the three countries, uh, conducted interviews with policymakers, um, actually on the top level as well, but also on the municipal level. Um, and uh, we digged into archives uh, to find uh, the earliest uh, family policy documents and so on and so forth. 
and we argued a lot with each other. So uh, that we, we uh, argued a lot particularly about the theoretical frame that we should have. And here is what we came up. We have actually three, I think, quite big shots or big, big deal, big, big things to say. Uh, beyond uh, describing the development of these three family policies, and I will describe, or I will mention now two. And these will be important for, for understanding the urban regime's uh, family policies as well. One of them, and you maybe don't see uh, exactly what is there, is that we think, or we, we found, that there is, in every country, there is an ideational orientation of family policies. Meaning that there are some main ideas that, he, that family policy makers focus on or put forward or push through. Um, and we found that in Poland, that's the mother, the matka polka, and women. And particularly uh, single mothers. So the state has to help single mothers. That was so important throughout the decades of pre-war years and, and later throughout the decades of state socialism and even today. So it is the mother. In Romania, it was the child uh, meaning that under the Ceausescu era, it was the quantity of children, that there should be more children born, no matter in what circumstances, no matter how. So there were really the harshest abortion uh, laws in uh, the 1960s in Romania. But that kind of really harsh um, ban on abortion and in this sense, maybe it's not a best word to say child orientation because it really was not about the child well-being of the children. That turned into an attention towards children's right throughout during the 1990s. Romania really wanted to uh, get rid of this past and focused its attention together with international actors like the UN to child welfare and to the right of the children. Whereas in Hungary, there has been a historical focus on the family, on the Hungarian family, and particularly to help families with at least three children. So that was some strange preoccupation of policymakers already at the turn of the century, as I will show you. This is something you could never think of in Poland or in Romania. Very interesting that even today it's unthinkable to launch a su successful campaign by any politician in Romania about the Romanian family. They tried it actually recently together with the Orthodox Church. They tried to um, some politicians try to initiate a campaign about defining the family as a man and a, a marriage of a man and a woman, right, in a traditional way, and that was a um, referenda, and it failed. It would not fail in Hungary, I tell you. Um, so it, it just doesn't work. There is no discourse about the family, whereas in Hungary, we don't hear anything else, just only discourse about the family. So just think about Switzerland. I'd be very uh, happy to, to, to hear which discourse uh, would you recognize there? Is it, would it really be more about the mothers or would it be about um, the Swiss family or would it be about um, child poverty? For instance, the UK or even the US is a good example, but the UK particularly, where you would never ever hear a discourse, especially not run by the state, about the family, the UK family or the British family or the English family. No, no way. But you would hear a lot of talk and a lot of policies about uh, child poverty. And there is a very strong actors like the Child Poverty Action Group and others who push through these policies for child poverty, which may end up to be the same kind of policies as like 
uh, in other countries, but the discourse around it is about, about child poverty. And you would never hear in the UK uh, any politicians say there should be more children born to the UK. No way. Why? They, they are actually afraid of too many children to be born because those children will likely to live in poverty. So they are rather, you know, restrictive in this, in their approach. And that's, that has historical roots. And the second thing that we found in this book and that sec second important uh, theoretical contribution is this. Um, we found that their early origins, in the early origins of social policies and family policies, I think it really applies to any kind of policies, environmental policies, whatever policies. So there are some fragmented programs that you see here, fragmented programs of A, B, C, and D, and I will give you some examples uh, for that, for Hungary. Uh, around the mid-war years, right, uh, until the 1960s. But in other policies, it may be later or earlier, whatever. And then these fragmented policies come together uh, to what we call the core policies, the core family policies during the modernization period of family policies. And this is what is going to be called in some countries the family policies, familian politics. Yeah, in the 1970s. There is no family policies before. The term family policies just starts to appear in the 1970s, and even then, not in every country. In Hungary, yes. Um, in France, yes. In Belgium, yes. Uh, but not, in Czechoslovakia, yes. But not, not in Poland and not in Romania, I know for sure and I, I'm not sure about Germany or Switzerland, okay? Right? And this core program package may be small or may be big. There may be a lot of programs like kindergarten, public kindergarten, public nurseries, family allowance, kindergarten, whatever. Uh, there may exist in the 1960s, 70s, or there may be very few of these, okay? So this core can be small or can be big. And then there are some contingent elements. Oh, I switched it off. Uh, contingent elements, these ones, A, e, F, and D, e, that got attached to these core programs later on. And these are more really contingent. They come and go. There is some reforms that do away with them, and there are some uh, uh, extensions, whatever. So you see, this program is plus and minus. It can change, right? By today, by after 1980s and 1940s, we argue that the core stays with us. It stays with us. I would almost say forever, right? There have been such policies in the 1930s or 40s in Hungary. They are still there today. And there are some other attachments to that that were att attached to the policies in the 1980s and 90s. They may come and go. So there is more change in the contingent cluster of programs than in the core. There should be some huge turmoil of policies or politics to change the core of a country. So we actually found an explanation for path dependency, for why policies last, and why other policies not last a minute. They just last for years and they get forgotten. I'm not sure if, if this is clear, I hope. Right, so what were these very first elements of Hungarian family policies. And where, why do I say that it has very deep roots? I found the first document from the 1860s in which a noble man who was interested in science 
claims that there are too few Hungarians born in one particular area of Hungary. There are much more Slovaks born and much more Germans born around there and not enough Hungarians. And he actually writes a letter to the state, to one of the governors saying, do something about it, okay? And already in 1891, under industrialization, we have the first compulsory insurance for paid maternity leave. And it, it, it is still with us, actually, the same kind of construction. Um, so for working mothers, there is a maternity leave. And also compulsory public kindergarten, 1891. Much earlier than most of the countries. And in fact, these kindergartens were placed to areas in Hungary where there were more more families, more people speaking non-Hungarian, right? So the kindergarten were a tool of modernization, of making children into Hungarians, right? In a multi-ethnic, multi-ethnic uh, surrounding and multi-ethnic multi big Hungarian uh, kingdom. But also kindergarten was, were set up in industrial areas to help uh, mothers go to work, right? And to keep their children in safe circumstances. In 1912, we already have the fir first legislation for kindergarten, for family allowance. Uh, at that point, still for civil servants. To, so that means that all state employees received family allowance for their children. And in 1938, this family allowance becomes uh, extended to all factory workers in Hungary. And it's an obligation. Uh, so the factory owners have to provide this extra money, this family wage to their employees. It's not an option. So you see that there are very early uh, signs of family policies, but when it really becomes boosted, uh, that is the Versailles Treaty of 1919, when Hungary from a big kingdom, big multi-ethnic kingdom, becomes a small uh, nation uh, of today, and um, many Hungarians actually uh, remain uh, outside of Hungary's border, for instance, in Romania. And then these ideas of let's make Hungary big from within reappear. So they, they become really, really strong, these nationalist ideas um, during the mid-war years. And this is uh, an example of that, um, that boost of policies. And I brought this to you because there is one policy that I will show you at the end that reminds us very much to this one. So Orban's policies actually point back to this era, um, and that's 1940, a fund for the protection of the nation and the families. Um, that is a loan uh, that is provided for four uh, families with four or more children, and they can buy uh, land from that loan and they can uh, purchase or build housing from that. And here comes the trick. If there is the fifth child born, then part of the loan is forgiven, right? So they, they can have to repay a smaller amount. If the sixth child is born, then even more is forgiven. And with the birth of the seventh child, uh, the whole loan is forgiven. And you will hear that Orban has exactly the same idea uh, and exactly the same policies today. This is the, the core idea of, of his policies. Only Christian and Hungarian families were eligible. So you have to pr had to prove your Hungarianness and your Christianity to receive this law. And part of these lands, and this is something I, I was uh, doing research on previously, for many years also in the archives. So I found that Jewish lands, Jewish estates were used from 1942 to 
provide uh, the Christian Hungarian poor large families with these estates, right? So there was a clear racial aspect to this and a clear eugenic aspect to this, which is, of course, not only in Hungary, it happened in Switzerland as well. Um, eugenics uh, was big here and was, of course, one of the core ideas of the Nazi uh, Germany as well. So there is a selection who should procreate, and it's the Christian Hungarians who should procreate um, uh, in the 1940s in Hungary. And I uh, brought a, a short... Uh, news um, video f f about it when um, you, what you will see is, um, is a presentation is how actually is how the Horty regime used this program for propaganda purposes okay so what you will see is here uh, beautiful families receiving this grant and uh, previously they lived in poverty whereas now they live among wonderful and nice circumstances. Az országos nép és családvédelmi alap programjának keretében több ezer családi ház átadása országszerte most van folyamatban. Hódmezővásárhelyen és szentesen, bensőséges ünnepség keretében adták át az arra érdemük és rászorultságuk után kiválasztott sok gyermekes családoknak az egészséges, ízléses, napsugaras házakat. A Békés Csanád és Csongrád vármegyék Viharsarok körzetében felépült 500. családi házat, egy a hazát vérével védő, szovjet harctéren küzdő, sok gyermekes szentesi honvéd családja nyerte el. So this was the... Uh, maybe you can um, the short video and what uh, what reminds me very much to what happens um, today is that Orban uses family policies for propaganda and also that this is not a universal kindergarten or family allowance but a very selective programs program that only reaches a part of the families. It is only the very large families, only those who prove their Christianity and their poverty and where the man goes to work and where the woman behaves really well and keeps the children tidy and so on and so forth. So I calculated about 5% of the needy families received such grant, whereas it is celebrated as if it was for all Hungarian families, okay? And the message goes through, and um, the government and Horty himself uh, becomes celebrated for these uh, population policies, as, as they called it uh, back that time, or the protection of the Hungarian family. Um, okay. Let's move on. So they, these are some pictures of the same scheme. This is the, the very poor peasant families uh, in the 1940s. And here is when they, from the, with the help of the loan, they build the house, uh, houses. We see very similar scenes today in Hungary. And here is the beautiful, fam beautiful house. Um, and um, yeah, the happy family. It has all sorts of interesting details, but I, I, I don't have the time to, to go into that. Now, after the Second World War, what, what do we see? May, let me just make a general remark about historical continuity. We found that in all the three countries, so Romania, Poland and Hungary, the huge political changes, like, for instance, a capitalist system turning to a communist system or communist system ending and becoming a capitalist system in the 1990s, these are not watersheds in family policies. In fact, these are not watersheds in social policies more generally either. Fam many of the family policies continue and evolve in like an onion, uh, various layers put on, on top of each other. 
This program that I have shown to you, that has disappeared because the communist system didn't want to, uh, didn't want to continue with anything that had to do with racism or eugenics. Uh, but other programs like the family allowances or like the maternity leave, they continued throughout the socialist, socialist period. And what is particular for Hungary, and you don't see in other countries, I mean, you don't see in Poland or Romania, but I don't think in Switzerland you would see anything like that, um, that Hungary had various family or population policy packages. So big overarching pieces of legislation that included payments and services, uh, the boost of all these together. So this also proves that, that fa the families have been in the center of Hungarian politics also throughout the communist years. And I would like to emphasize maybe one of these policies and that's the 1967 long paid uh, maternity leave that is the longest in Europe and maybe in the world back then. So three year long maternity leave for all mothers, all working mothers, and of course because work was compulsory, uh, all mothers could receive this uh, benefit. They didn't have to stay at home and utilize this benefit, but they had the option whether they wanted to work or they wanted to stay at home with their children. This was a kind of a maternalist turn in Hungary or a conservative turn within the communist system because it really wanted to relegate uh, women to, to their homes. And it of course had economic, uh, economic um, causes that I, I can elaborate if you would like. At the same time, uh, there was an expansion of kindergarten and creches, particularly in the 1970s and 80s. So then we get to the 1990s, uh, the period that we call the retrenchment and reform in the book. In Hungary, it, it is much more reform than retrenchment. Uh, there were only two, two um, instances of retrenchment, one of them in 1966, uh, with the Socialist Liberal Coalition in power, they stopped some of these programs that I was talking about. They made family allowance, kindergeld, means tested. And they also stopped one of the parental uh, leaves. At, at the end of this, or the result of this, was a huge political failure. That they, they failed and Fidesz came to power and said, uh, they are against the Hungarian families and I am for the Hungarian families and they could win the elections really easily. And they did reinstate re the earlier existing policies. Um, the same uh, mistake was made by the socialist government uh, in 2009 during the economic crisis when they were also in power since 2004 to 2009. There, were huge political, um, there was a huge political and economic crisis back then in Hungary and the Socialist Party, they didn't want to listen to me <laughs> and hear the message that in Hungary don't touch family policies if you want to stay in power. You can touch any other policies but not family policies. They did cut family policies quite fiercely. That very much helped Fidesz come to power in 2010. They can again say, these are against the Hungarian families and we are for the Hungarian families. And you know, that is, that is the message Hungarians really like to hear. Now, we got to uh, Orban's uh, family policies finally. What is this? Um, first of all, he made a huge change, really paradigmatic change to how we should understand families. It was not really defined earlier, not in the constitution or anywhere, and Hungary was also a kind of a, a modern or postmodern uh, society, or is even today, with a, an increasing plurality of families, and also the incre increasing recognition of non-traditional or non-heterosexual, non-nuclear non, 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 uh, um, non families. Uh, still, 
he insisted on carving that into, into the new fundamental law, which they accepted, they adopted a new constitution uh, unilaterally, where they define the family as a married women and men and children. And in 2020, just recently under COVID, they added uh, the mother is a, a woman, a father is a man, which sounds absolutely stupid, but this is so important for them because if this is in the constitution, then you can never ever have gay marriage in Hungary, right? Unless there is an opposition party that comes into power with two thirds majority and, that is, and can change the constitution, which is very unlikely today. Um, other legislation, the law on the protection of families, remember the 1940 protection of the Hungarian nation and families, law on the protection of families is also a so-called cardinal act that, they, that a new party can only change with two-thirds majority. So it's the most important um, rules of new Hungarian family policies are actually carved into marble or stone, so to say. And so even if there would be a change of government, they could not change it, only if they had the two-thirds two -thirds majority. The same applies to the flat PAT, PIT, personal income tax, that is 16%, so the top personal income tax, 28%, was cut to 16, whereas the 0% was increased to 16. So actually the poor or uh, the low income earners had to pay more, whereas the rich uh, had to pay much less taxes since then. And the central piece in 2011, uh, Orban adopted was uh, the major tax credit that you see here, I tried to calculate for Swiss francs. Uh, which is for one or two children, it's 26 uh, Swiss francs per child. Uh, so it's, it's quite a low, 78 uh, uh, francs per family per month. Whereas for three plus families, it's 90 per child. So it's 270 per family per month with three children. And of course, much more if you have more kids. That's an amount that I think you could also recognize in Switzerland, right? So it's not like a, a very small amount. But in Hungary, back in 2011, that was a huge amount. So with the number of children, this amount increases vastly, especially if you have three or more kids. You remember what I said about Hungarian orientation, family orientation, this strange preoccupation of having three children. This reappears with Orban, and I really don't know whether, whether he has like historians uh, telling him about these historical examples, or this is some kind of a, a natural um, sense that he has uh, what, what, what uh, rings a bell for Hungarians. Um, because this family tax allowance doesn't have an upper cap, so if you earn, I don't know, a billion francs, you will receive it. Uh, it really advances or it really uh, gives a lot to better off families with many children, right? Whereas it doesn't give a penny to unemployed families, not, nothing. And also uh, very few foreigns uh, for low income earners. A second example I want to give you is a 2015 so-called family housing program. We call it the CHOC. Here is the minister, Novak, um, uh, talking about it. And that's also a big amount. As, and as far as I know, it was said by Orban that it should not be two or three million foreigns, but it should be 10 million foreigns uh, for three plus families. And that is, I calculated, 53,000 uh, francs, uh, that only those families where at least one of the parents has been employed for three years can get. Not the unemployed, not those who have like scattered work record, nobody else, only those in stable employment. And again, no upper cap, 
And you can actually have several flats or apartments or even houses. You can have five houses and you will still, still receive it. So the peculiarity of these policies really is that there is no upper class, uh, cap. The richest also receive it, whereas the poor are excluded, outright excluded. Now, uh, another interesting thing is that young couples, if they, can, if, if they marry, you would marry, you would decide to marry your uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, you would get married, then you could promise a, a one or two or three children or four or whatever. If you promise one child, promise to the state, literally, then you would receive, I don't know, one and a half million forints. If you promise two children, then you receive five million forints. And if you promise three children, then you get the whole amount. 53,000, right? I mean, you could think about that. Uh, and uh, many of my students uh, and my colleagues, young colleagues, have been thinking about that, and they, they now got married. So there is the marriage rates in Hungary are skyrocketing, like they're really, really uh, boosted. Uh, the fertility rates, I mean the number of children that are born, are not really uh, going that speedily upwards. But there is there also some advancement. I, I, I will t uh, tell you the exact numbers if you want. But it, it is a biopolitical system, I would say, that urges or that um, prioritizes and that gives a lot of money to heterosexual married couples with three or more children. In 2018, this was elevated to a, an even higher level when uh, the demographic governance was at, uh, announced by Orban when he said in his speech that he wants to make a new compact with the Hungarian women, right? And that compact would be about providing more possibilities, more money, and women should give birth to more children, right? So that is the new Family Protection Action Plan with completely free uh, personal, uh, personal income tax um, for mothers of three or more children. So if you already have three, uh, four kids, sorry, four this time, four kids, then you just don't pay any taxes anymore in your life, right? Uh, of course, you pay VAT, but you don't pay personal income tax. There is this grant, grant to buy a van for three plus families. Uh, just a, a footnote here, Orban has a van himself and five children, right? So I, I should have said that earlier, that he is a fan of football, so Hungary is now full of huge football stadiums. And at the same time, we have a family policy that is kind of designed to his own family, like rich family with lots of children, like five, five kids. And he likes to drive that van himself. And I think this is where the idea comes from, this uh, giving money for families to buy vans, right? And uh, the um, already mentioned loan for the new vet couples, but this is a new, lo new loan, a loan that you can spend on anything, everything, right? Imagine you just receive uh, 26,000 Swiss francs, and for that, you all, all you have to do is to get married and promise to have children, and you spend that money on whatever you want, really. It's, this money is not for housing, it's just for anything. I mean, you can uh, spend it to buy a new guitar, you can go on holidays to the Bahamas, whatever, really, anything you want. You can organize a wonderful wedding. Uh, okay. Uh, and again, only for couples uh, where at least one of them has a three-year employment record, they have to marry, they have to promise the children, and remember what I said about the 1940 program, 
the loan is halted if the, child, the first child is born for three years. You don't pay anything once the child is born. It is halved, sorry, I uh, made a mistake. It is halved with the second child and it is completely foregone with the third child. So you actually pay back the money with children. Right, and here is again uh, that picture uh, from the beginning. This is uh, celebrating this new type of loan from uh, 2019. Now, finally, this, I'm coming to the end of my lecture, uh, the uh, big um, continuous, I have this one, line, this one is Hungary. So you see that historically throughout the 2000s, Hungary has been one of the greatest spenders on family policies, meaning at one point here, before Orban comes to power, 3% of the GDP is spent on family policies. Before we had all these programs, right? That's the, just the normal parental leaves, kindergarten, family allowance, whatever, okay? Orban comes to power and this ratio is decreasing. Why? I told you about all these beautiful programs. Why does then spending decrease? This is just impossible, right? But it is not impossible because Orban cut, uh, here is, it's very interesting how the Polish rate actually goes up and you will, I think, have a Polish uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, at one point. Uh, what they do is very, very interesting. I, I, I can tell you about that as well if you want. What does Orban do? Actually, family allowances, the kindergarten decreased vastly by 50%. So payments that go to all families, to every family, every single family, those are decreased. Social assistance for poor families were completely stopped. You don't have any payment, any benefit today's Hungary that would be directed, targeted to poor, poor families. They only receive in-kind benefits like free uh, food at the school, free meals and free books for their children in, the, in school and so on. But no money, and this is one of the central ideas of Orban, no money for families who do not work, no handouts, not a penny, not a filler in Hungarian, okay? At the same time, benefits for working couples were upgraded, and there, there is a boost of these strange animals, tax credits, grants, and loans, and these loans that I have shown to you, they are provided through banks, right? It is the bank that gives you that money, and the state gives the money to the bank. So there is no relationship directly between the state and you who receive this benefit, but rather there is the banks who are providing these loans. This is what social policy calls social policy by other means. This is not the usual redistribution so that we have social insurance benefits or taxes and the state redistributes them to the needy. So that's classic social policy. Forget about that in today's Hungary. We have all these very strange new animals these loans and grants and that now, I calculated before I came here, take up as much money as all the other benefits. So all the benefits that shrink, they are, I don't know, one and a half or two percent of the GDP and about that amount, about two percent of the GDP is now spent on these tax credits, grants and loans that all serve families on average wage or above. One example, one calculation to that, 2017, uh, I didn't find the abrogated one now. Uh, this is what a, uh, the change of the benefits that is received by an unemployed family. This is uh, the changes to the benefits uh, received by a middle by a family on the minimum wage, and this is what is received by a family on the average wage and above. 
plus the new loans and grants and, and, and benefits. Tax credit is calculated here. It's, it's this one. So you see that a rich or middle class family receives this much of a tax uh, credit, whereas they receive this much and they receive none. Conclusions. So the Hungarian state under Orban promotes explicitly what they call the responsible families. That is families who have the means to, um, to uh, upbring their children in wealthy uh, circumstances. So there is a clear upward redistribution uh, which, is, which goes completely against uh, the European social model or the European welfare state as we know it. There is also selective pronatalism. So it's not explicitly said that it should be the white families, but still the Hungarian families should procreate just like uh, in the pre-war years, uh, which also means that there is a, there is a, a selection, a tacit selection of Roma families who should not receive a penny. But it's not only the Roma who don't, don't receive because not all, actually most of the poor in Hungary are not Roma families. Um, I think this is something I already said. Um, at the same time, we have to realize that family policy is a very important uh, political tool in the hands of autocratizing regimes. Recently, I looked into uh, the Russian uh, developments. We have seen a very similar development of social policy by other means uh, in Russia for families. There is selective pronatalism, and at the same time, there is an anti-LGBTQ discourse, and also the harshest anti-LGBTQ legislation that Hungary issued in 2022, very recently. I, I'm happy to elaborate on that as well, if you're interested. There, there are very strong historical roots to this, uh, to the family and demography-centered Hungarian state, that means that Hungary, uh, that Orban rings a, a positive bell uh, for Hungarians. They like these policies. This is a positive message about the otherwise very harsh and confrontative Orban regime, also for the outside. And finally, this is what you see if you arrive to uh, Budapest airport today. It has huge signs uh, with all the languages, all, all the major languages you can imagine, saying uh, family and friendly Hungarian, or family friendly Hungary, and well, in all, all the languages you see in huge billboards. So this shows, uh, I just uh, took this photo when I came here. So it's, it's, it's very new. This shows how important it is for uh, Orban and the Hungarian politics today to brand it as a family-friendly uh, country. But as I explained, it is not for all Hungarian families. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>Thank you so much. I, I must say I learned so much also about these historical roots, which I found absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure we will have quite a lot of questions. May I start with one myself? It's very obvious that this, as you pointed it out, it uses a lot of money. And I find it very interesting what you said about many different social um, sort of uh, departments of social politics being reunited into one, mm -hmm. and then a family policy gets like the big chunk of the cake, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens to the other benefits, like old age, for example, mm -hmm. which is in all European countries a big, a big topic and something that grows, and and also education and health maybe, but but benefits for other social groups. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. are they on the decline, and is there no opposition to that? Mm -hmm. um, for health and education, I can say that those are the completely neglected policy areas. And I think it's absolutely conscious from Orban to, to, to actually take money out of these services or any, any social services. Um, and 
There is big discontent with that in current Hungary. So there have been huge demonstrations uh, led by healthcare workers and also by, by um, teachers. And there is now a, a, um, an illegal strike of teachers uh, that has been going on for, for many months. But uh, according to the new labor code, it is nearly impossible, if not completely impossible, to organize a strike in, um, in any public areas. So, um, and now, well, teachers were, and also um, uh, lead, heads of hospitals have been uh, fired for their, for their, their discontent. Um, yeah, so that area is, is really in a bad shape and uh, we already see it in the PISA results uh, for the education, really bad. Actually the worst results in many uh, instances for Hungary. Uh, about pensions, uh, that's a whole big story, maybe in a nutshell. You may have heard uh, in 2010 and 11 that Orban completely stopped the Hungarian private insurance system. So we had a two-layered system, uh, which is one public scheme and another one a compulsory private uh, insurance scheme. And Orban decided to, I would say, confiscate the private scheme, meaning that people had to leave the private scheme and go back to the, or go to the public scheme some of their money they received in a lump sum, but most of it went to the state budget. That was 10% of the Hungarian GDP. So it was kind of a blackmailing of Hungarian employees who were in this private scheme because they said that if you don't go back to the public scheme, that you, then you will lose the public part of your pension. So people rushed back to the public scheme and, and then, uh, yeah, the private pensions were just stopped in Hungary. So, so that, was, that was, that was one story. And, and through this, the public pension system became um, sustainable on the mid, mid run, I would say. But that had a huge price, and that was a very, that was, I, I call it the dress rehearsal or, of illiberal mm -hmm. uh, politics, uh, what happened to the pension system, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for this extremely interesting uh, talk. I have many questions, but I would like to ask two different ones. One is um, what we witnessed during the last couple of Orban years is this major brain drain of young people, that um, mostly liberals who left Hungary, who left with CEU, um, uh, who, who found a new future outside of Hungary. And I guess this must mean quite a large um, shortage of labor. Mm -hmm. So work short, uh, no, not workshop, it's shortage of labor and uh, as we witness in many countries even in switzerland of educated uh, well educated um, labor is uh, is missing everywhere and i mean this collides somehow with this maternity leave mm. policy and mothers having five children i mean you can forget to have a good education in this time or did they increase mm -hmm. the childcare models so mm. you just put your five children in childcare and go to university <laughs> i mean uh, does hungary have a problem with this uh, short yeah of yeah i uh, i can answer maybe that mm -hmm. uh, with this uh, um, graffiti here um, it says uh, we we uh, our message to Brussels is to stop uh, migration uh, out uh, to stop in migration right and it says out migration ki that is a huge that is the real problem of Hungarians yeah and then it, it says this person who changed the wording uh, that is the problem uh, out migration from Hungary that Fidesz is absolutely silent about. What I don't really understand why the opposition is silent about it, because uh, several hundreds of thousands of people, it is estimated that around 500,000 people, people left the country since 2010, 
that from a 10 million, that is a huge, huge number. And it's mainly youngsters, of course, who will, if the government wants them to have children, they will not have children in Hungary for sure. So that is a, that is a big, big, big deal. And now we do have labor shortages, in fact, Orban now invited workers from Latin America, so we have a huge in-migration, silent in-migration, uh, from mainly, mainly from Latin America and also from Africa, I, I suppose, but nobody really knows that. And it seems that in these uh, big new factories uh, around batteries, you, the, which is uh, the new business of Orban, this battery, uh, building factories, Chinese mainly, there are these workers there, but they're kept separated. Uh, they're probably not allowed to leave that area. So people don't really meet these people. We don't really see what is going on, but certainly there is in migration now from uh, the global south. It's extremely uh, interesting what's ha happening and yeah. how um, ambiguous his policies are in this respect. Now, for a second question, I, I've been observing this, uh, what's it called, this World Congress of Families? Yes, exactly. Yeah. For a couple of years, and I'm yeah, sometimes watching... Yeah, we have World watching Congress the of Family and also the World Demographic Forum. Yeah, so these two strange... I, I'm, I'm witnessing, the, um, yeah. I'm some, watching them sometimes on YouTube. And, uh, and I mean, uh, Orban suddenly pops, pops up in these meetings of at course. a very early stage. And, and I wanted to ask you about this entanglement and the new, new alliances outside Europe. Because mm -hmm. some of the comparisons you did were on Europe and comparing Poland, but also mm -hmm. comparing EU's main policy and Hungary. But I see, when I watch these YouTubes, I see this um, closeness to Orthodox Russia, but I also yeah. to, um, to United States conservatives. Yes. Absolutely. So if, uh, I would be very interested. To that would be a new research I would love to do, yeah, to, to see how, uh, how uh, foreign affairs are shaped by these new alliances Orban makes because, of course, he doesn't have any alliance with any European politician now, apart from Maloney, maybe, but only outside of Europe. And these are the far-right um, key figures on the far-right in the US. Um, and actually, yeah, um, also in Germany and, and elsewhere. But I, I didn't put that together yet. For sure, he uses these forms, and, and maybe these are designed exactly for this purpose to build these uh, supranational alliances of uh, conservatives or, or well, not, not yeah, far, far right um, paleo conservatives, so to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question is about uh, the unstable uh, thing that is family planning. What's happening when you promise children and there are none, or if the the family uh, there's a divorce? Mm. That's actually a very good question, and it's I think it's getting really tragic. We see tragic stories already now when there is a couple that took this loan, right? And you have to promise the children to be born. What if there is domestic violence? What is, what is they want to divorce? They, uh, according to what they sign, they shouldn't divorce within 10 years. And if they don't have the child, they have to prove that it's, it's a medical issue and not them, them not wanting a child. So it really is the state looking into your bedroom and even further, because if you don't prove that you have a medical issue, then you have to repay the loan with an extra punitive interest rate. And so then, and, and you have to pay it back together. So that sticks couples together and also um, 
urges them financially to, you know, to, to have children, even if there is a problem within the relationship. It's a, a very intrusive policy, I would say, really, uh, like biopolitics. Yeah. Yep. Do you have a follow-up? Mm -hmm. um, and when there is a family with like uh, five children and then there is a divorce? Well, once your kids are born, your loan is for gone. You're safe. You can divorce. <laughs> and start a new family with another yes. woman or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, a follow-up. Which time frame are we talking about? Is there a certain number of years you've got time to produce the amount of children? You have you? two years. Two years. Uh, actually, I have a, a very good friend who is in this, in this situation now. They have the two kids born. They got married because of uh, this loan. Uh, two kids are born, and now it turns out that there really is a trouble in the relationship. The, the, the guy started to be violent. What does this poor mm -hmm. girl do, my friend? How where uh, there is you know there is problem with how she would manage with a, a very small baby and a little one that is one and a half year old. Uh, she cannot go to work for sure because there is the very small, the infant one. For a while she has to stay at home and she would have to rely on, on his husband. And uh, they still have to pay back half of the loan. They have the second child so it's only, only half of the loan. But they still have to pay back half of the loan. Uh, that is a trouble. Mm -hmm. Could you explain, I haven't really understood uh, the increase in Poland of the fertility mm -hmm. of the kids, you know, you showed us more than two, you know, in Europe it's, or in Switzerland it's 1.4 and in Hungary it's two and Poland increased like that. What, what is exactly the reason? That's the spending on family policy. So that's not the fertility rate. That's the spending on family policies. How much the state spends. And for Poland, uh, I can say that for many years or decades throughout the state socialism and after, family policy was not a priority for the Polish state. Until... Uh, peace came to power for the first time when they made family policies kind of a priority and is issued some programs, for instance, extended parental leave. But then when they came to power for the second time in 2015, they placed family policy in the center of their agenda. I think they copied it from Orban. And also I think Kaczynski genuinely wanted a change here as well. Uh, with Poland also having a decreasing fertility rate for many years. So then they issued something that is called the 500 plus, which uh, provided 500 slotties for every family. It's a huge amount. I can, I'm, I'm not sure I can uh, translate it to, uh, to Swiss francs, but it's a very big amount for a kindergeld meaning that if a family had three children, then it was uh, worth the minimum wage. And every single Polish family received that money, even with one child or two children or three or four or whatever number of children. And there was no other prerequisite. You, don't, you didn't have to be poor, you didn't have to work. So it's not like Orban's policy that you have to be employed. It's completely universal for the first time in the Polish history, actually. And now that um, there is a change of government in Poland, as, as you know, at, and uh, Donald Tusk comes back to power after many years, I think one of the key elements of him winning the Polish people's hearts was that he said, we will keep, uh, actually, by the promise of peace, 800 plus. So they, they promised to increase it to 800 uh, zlotys. We will keep 800 plus and we will index it with inflation. That's what Donald Tusk said. 
So after many years of austerity policies that he uh, engaged in and neoliberal policies, he said, no, this is important. This is, this is something that we also want. And I think that was, that was key to him winning the elections. And th this 500 plus program, this was the one that boosted Polish family policy spending and actually welfare spending in general. Um, I am wondering, from what you said about Donald Tusk in Poland, um, how is this in Hungary? Is there any, like the opposition, how do they respond to this family, this like omnipresent family thing? Mm -hmm. Do they try to counter the narrative or, yeah? Um. I'm silent because I'm, I'm so, um, I'm, I'm really sad that there is no counter narrative. And um, I have to tell you that I was consulted uh, in the early urban years by uh, opposition parties. And I told them this story that family, family and family policies are very important. They are key. Please find a message in family policies for the electoral campaign. So that was my advice. They never ever listened to it. Uh, what I advised, what, what I, I keep repeating when, when the Hungarian media asks me, uh, the very small opposition media that is still there, uh, I, I'm always saying, uh, Kindergeld, Kindergeld, Kindergeld. It would be such a, a very easy message that Orban uh, cut the Kindergeld uh, by 50% under his rule. Uh, let's uh, double uh, the kindergarten. Let's make it. That, let's triple it. You know, and that would be popular among Hungarians, and that would be a universal benefit. That would be something like the Polish did. So there is an example, and they can say, "We will do this, and we will not do the other quite stupid types of loans." Uh, from that money, we could make a, a whole lot of change to to the well-being of Hungarian families. But there is no counter-narrative, unfortunately. Uh, there, there has been some campaigns throughout the 2015, in 2014-15, by a small green opposition party for crashes. And um, the uh, salaries, the payments, and the circumstances in which uh, nurses work in crashes, things like that. And that was important, you know, to put an emphasis on, on services. That would be another good message to send, you know, that you don't care about services, you know, that's, uh, let's stand behind uh, those movements of, of teachers and nurses. So that would be another good thing uh, an opposition party could do. You may. Uh, maybe, maybe just one, one final thing about why the opposition is so silent. I think uh, the major opposition party that used to be the socialists, that are the post-communist socialist party, reformed socialists, whatever, they still cannot face what they have done so far previously, like Tusk, uh, that they made really harsh retrenchments, right? Not only in family policies, but in, in other areas as well. So they cannot, they, they somehow didn't find themselves and they didn't find their new voice saying, that was then, but we think it another way now or something like this. They, they don't seem to be able to, to transform. Um try to read my notes. Um, yeah, usually uh, we witness that when states enforce family policy, it often has to do with demography, that the population is getting too old and there are too few children and so on. And uh, what, what do you show today is this link, not, not so also to demography, but um, also to uh, ethno-nationalism. And I, I wonder, when exactly did this start? Um, 
is it really the Haughty era? I, I think, uh, actually, as a historian myself, I think the Haughty era is mm -hmm. the reference era for mm -hmm. Orban, and I think mm -hmm. it's no coincidence that these things sound almost identical to the yeah, Haughty yeah. programs. Um, but uh, but still, I wonder whether it was really ethno-nationalism in Horty's time or more about demography after the First World War. I don't know. But when did it pop up in... Um, in, in Orban's uh, program that it became also a Hungarian ethnic issue? It was all always there, I think. Uh, but when he found that <coughs> this anti-migration campaign is a good one in terms of politics and that this can be linked to family policies, that was a moment, I think. That was a moment in 2015 when he started very early on an anti-migration campaign that no foreigner should take your job, something like this. This is how it started. No, no foreigners should come to this country to take your jobs. Anyone who comes to this country has to comply with our rules, things like that, huge billboards all over the country. And then when they invented this link between, okay, this is the negative message, this is the fear that we want to create in the society, and people really started to get fearful even before they saw any, anyone coming from Syria or elsewhere, uh, when they invented this, okay, but then the positive message is that we want Hungarian families to be strong. That, that's, that was the point when it really became so ethnicized or racialized even, I think. Yeah. But there is no explicit word about Roma families, about the gypsy. It's, it's very rare that Orban would touch upon that or and be explicitly racist against the Roma, very interestingly. Um, thank you very much for this really, really interesting uh, lecture. Um, our second um, talk was about uh, abortion in Yugoslavia. Uh -huh. And uh, could you say something also about the abortion, abortion policy in Hungary today and also in the socialist uh, time? Well, talking about Poland, clearly, I'm sure you have heard. Uh, yeah, that Kaczynski uh, failed in pushing abortion uh, ban too far. Uh, and Orban is smarter. Uh, Hungar in Hungary, abortion is uh, more or less free. Although the far right, there is an even more far right party in Hungary than Orban, they're pushing for um, a stricter abortion legislation. And what uh, Fidesz did was, to the push of the far right, to issue a legislation that mothers, well, mothers, but women with a, a fetus, um, they have to listen to the heartbeat of the fetus before they decide whether they really want the abortion or not. So this was as far as Orban went, but because in Hungary, since actually very interestingly, ever since the fall of the 1956 revolution, when Kadar's, one of Kadar's first move was to make abortion free, um, Ever since then, abortion was more or less free in my country. So that is also kind of ingrained into Hungarians' minds and they would be against a strict abortion legislation. So I think Orban is smart enough not to risk that. Thank you if there's no more, any more questions? Well, if not, thank you so much again. I think we've all learned a lot and have a lot to think about. And it will also, I think, be very inspiring to take 
all this, especially also the comparative perspectives mm -hmm. um, with us for our next talk. So thanks again for coming here. And yes, thank you for coming. We'll see each other in two weeks here. Thank, thank you. you very much. Do them with the beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea.